Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Today's podcast is sponsored by the National Theological College and Graduate School strategically placed school with three campuses in the Middle East and one in East Africa. To learn more about how you can assist them financially in training Christian workers in this very strategic area of the world, visit ntcgs.org. That's ntcgs.org. It is a pleasure to have Dr. Stephen Bramer back in the podcast studio today to continue our discussion on the millennium and to wrap up our podcast series on the end times. By the way, if you missed last week's podcast, you'll want to go back and listen to it first, as today's podcast will build upon that one. Dr. Stephen Bramer is the Department Chair and Professor of Bible Exposition here at Dallas Theological Seminary. He completed studies at Ontario Bible College, the University of Waterloo, Ontario Theological Seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and earned his Ph.D. from Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Bramer is also a teaching pastor at Waterbrook Bible Fellowship and leads annual trips to the land of Israel and Jordan for Insight for Living and Dallas Theological Seminary. Well, John the Baptist comes on the scene in the Gospels and preaches that the kingdom of God is at hand. And then Jesus, his message is the same. What was Jesus offering? Who was he offering it to? And why didn't it come to fruition? Yeah, John the Baptist was the forerunner. He was preparing them for Jesus, and he was saying the kingdom is coming. Of course, they didn't respond to John. The religious leaders didn't respond to John, and then they don't respond to Jesus. But when Jesus shows up to start to minister, he repeats the same message, John the Baptist, that the kingdom is at hand. And I think if the Jewish people, and it's to the Jewish people, it's not to the world at that point, if the Jewish people had understood Daniel chapter 9, they would have understood that 483 years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, not the return from exile, decree to rebuild Jerusalem, that the anointed one would come, they would understand that when the anointed one shows up, there is only a seven-year period left, then the kingdom would be established. And so when he says the kingdom is near, it's not just near because Christ was there. It was near in actuality that they needed to respond to this king who is uh, shown to be a fulfillment of prophecy, shown to be the one who can do miracles. He is the one that they were hoping for, and yet they don't want him because they have their own aspirations about mm. being in charge. The Sadducees would see him as a threat, wouldn't you say? Sadducees see him as a threat, I think, politically. Probably the Pharisees see him as a threat because he's coming and interpreting the word. Not differently, not, mm-hmm. not spiritually. He's interpreting it the way it should have been interpreted, even yeah. from the Old Testament. He's going back to the original meaning. And so he, he was a threat. He was a threat, Pharisees, Sadducees. And so in chapter 10, when he is instructing his disciples to go out, he once again is going out. You're supposed to preach about the kingdom. And yet he's saying, but only to Jews. Mm. They are his instrument Mm -hmm. to bring his kingdom on earth. And Mm. so they're told only to go to, to Jewish people. And last week we talked with Dr. Klingler about one of the important purposes of the tribulation is to bring Israel back to, the, to Yahweh and to accept the Messiah t- in preparation for the kingdom to be established. Absolutely. And that would have occurred, I believe, in the seven years after Christ on Palm Sunday offered himself as the king. They said, crucify him, crucify him, we'll have no king but Caesar. So they made their decision. Because of that, in Matthew chapter 10, when he'd sent them out, he said, now there will be persecution following. But when we get to Matthew chapter 12, they commit the unpardonable sin. And because of that, they do not recognize him as their king. They don't recognize him in his miracles given by the Holy Spirit, don't recognize him in the words that he's spoken, and therefore they're rejecting him as their king. The unpardonable sin 
all I don't believe can be committed today. Yeah. It is during the time that Christ was on earth offering the kingdom and himself as king to the Jewish people. They refused. They said he's actually from Satan. They blaspheme him. And so because of that, although the kingdom was near up to that point, at least in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom is never said to be near again. Because of their committing the unpardonable sin, it will not come in seven years. And you see a shift in Jesus' methods and his ministry. He goes to more parables, right? In the he Matthews goes to gospel. parables and he goes to, to really spending time with his disciples. And in Matthew 16, he talks about establishing the church. In Matthew 18, he talks about church discipline. So he is beginning to make the preparations for the fact that when he comes in Palm Sunday, they will reject him. But the disciples will look back and say, okay, I realize that, that was a turning point when our leaders committed the unpardonable sin. He calls them a wicked, perverse generation. And of course, Jesus did not pull any punches when he's speaking of the religious leaders who are blind leading the blind, who are like whitewashed sepulchers, beautiful on the outside, like the Kidron Valley, all those beautiful tombs, ornate yeah. tombs, but they're like dead bodies on the inside. So this is the religious leaders are really leading them to the Broadway that leads to destruction. Absolutely. In Matthew 23, he uses that prophetic oracle called the woe oracle. Mm -hmm. And I always say woe means, oh, oh, you're in big, big trouble. And, <laughs> and when you get a woe pronounced against you, you are in trouble. And it was against those Sadducees that were leading the people astray that he declared a woe against them. Don't listen to how they're practicing the word. Don't, don't pay attention to them. So we're always careful about the way we coin it because we don't believe that all Jewish people are guilty for like what Hitler would say, the Christ killers, right? That's not at all. No, absolutely not. But the religious leaders who, according to the Old Testament, had the right, the privilege, the responsibility for making a decision on behalf of the nation, they were the ones who rejected him. I mean, there were lots of people up there in Galilee, I think on Palm Sunday, the reason that they're throwing down their cloaks and the palm leaves is because they've come down from right. Galilee to Jericho. They've come up over the top of the Mount of Olives. They're not the religious leaders in Jerusalem. When he gets in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it's a whole different story. And the people are flocking to him. It's word spreading. And again, he's a big threat to these Sadducees. They're controlling the temple, but they really, they're pretty happy in their financial situation. They've bought in power from the Roman authorities. They don't want things to change, do they? No, and, and here's this man who can feed them and can heal them. I mean, why wouldn't you go after a king like that? And real quickly, in Matthew 16, 28, I love this verse that Sometimes it's misinterpreted as being amillennial when it says, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then the very next verse is six days later, Jesus takes them up to the a Mount of Mount Transfiguration. Transfiguration. And they get a, a little miniature view that the kingdom will come. Yeah. And Christ will be on earth, and the Old Testament saints will be there. How they figure out that Christ came in his glory up to now. I mean, there are some who believe he came back in 70 AD, but that does not seem to fulfill the imagery of Christ coming with his glory to establish his kingdom. But he let the disciples know, I am the one, and I can do this. Yeah, and so that's pretty remarkable. I think, I wish that chapter break wasn't right there. You know, verse 28, and then chapter 17, verse 1. It seems to be very clear that what Jesus is predicting happens six days later. Exactly. That Peter, James, and Context is John huge, see. and just ignore those chapter divisions too many times. They're in the wrong place. Yeah. But In Romans 11, the Apostle Paul addresses the subject of the restoration of the nation of Israel. He asks and answers the question, is God done with Israel? What was Paul's response, and how does that relate to the millennium? Romans chapter 9 through 11 is the section that centers in on the Jewish people and how they work out in God's program, because the book of Romans is about righteousness. And then you start thinking, well, is God righteous? Did he do what was right with his promises to Israel? And I think Paul, before he goes on to talk about how righteous people need to be living in chapter 12 and following, takes up this question, has God somehow forgotten Israel, or did he somehow take those promises and applied them to someone else. And Paul, especially in chapter 11, gives this wonderful picture that the stump had come through the Old Testament, all of God's promises. And yet because the Jewish people not responded, they as natural bances had been 
cut off and wild branches. And Paul refers them to to you and me, to Gentiles who were not founded upon all of those promises, that we were grafted into that root. And therefore, we experience many of the blessings, not all of them, but many of the blessings that the Jewish people would have expected. But Paul then says, look, if God could take wild branches and put them in, Mm. don't you think he could take natural branches Mm. and graft them back in? And of course, he's implying, yes, God can, and yes, God will. And so we come to the New Testament and the other epistles. We realize that the the Gentile people are not getting all the promise of the Old Testament. They're not getting the land. They're not getting Jerusalem, but they are receiving those blessings that God has determined because of his death and burial, resurrection, that he will offer to even Gentile people at this present time. Paul asks and answers the question, is God done with Israel? By no means, right? right. I'm, I'm Jewish. People are coming to faith in Christ. They're Jewish. And one day, all Israel will be saved. That's it. There are Jewish people coming to know the Lord, but that doesn't fulfill that prophecy that all Israel, and by all we mean, you know, the majority that you can say Israel is turning to the Lord. Zechariah 12 talks about someday they'll look upon the one whom they've pierced, and they'll mourn for him as they mourn for an only son, and then forget the chapter break, and you just go on there in chapter 13, verse 1, and there'll be a fountain uh, flowing that will take care of their sin. And so someday the descendants of Abraham as a group, as a community, as not a political nation, but but as a national body will come mm-hmm. to the Lord. Mm-hmm. And we believe that's during the tribulation period, right? Yes. Where we have yes. two witnesses and then 144,000 witnesses, 12,000 from each tribe. And once again, you know, that tribulation period is that 70th week of Daniel. So people say, well, you know, will the church be there? Well, no, because that is not for us. That is for the Jewish people. That's fulfilling what Daniel had said about Daniel's people in Daniel's city. And so I believe that there's a a pre-tribulational rapture so that God can once again perform all those things in the nation of Israel that he talked about back in Daniel chapter 9 about bringing an end to sin and, and restoring righteousness. And so that period of time will both be for the Jews to recognize Christ and then to do what they've always been tasked with doing, and that is declare him to the nations. And I believe that they will. We talked about the pre-tribulational rapture three sessions ago with Dr. Kim. And so I encourage you to go back and listen to that if you haven't already, where we are excited for the imminent return of the Lord to meet us in the air. And and we'll be with him forever from that point forward. When he's in heaven, we'll be with him. When he returns to earth to establish the kingdom, we get the privilege to rule and reign. With our new bodies and uh, robes of righteousness, the righteous acts of the saints, I'm looking forward to that. I am too. And Romans 11 speaks of the Gentiles and Israel separately. Separately, right? So yes, there's a yes. clear identification of both in the same text. So we don't want to confuse Israel and the church or Israel and the Gentile Correct. nations. Now, in, in eternity, of course, we will all be one because the Jewish people were chosen to be the means by which they would come to the Lord. But God so loved the whole world and his desire that the whole world, Jew, Gentile, male, female, young, old, that all of us would come at a level place at the cross and be uh, one body ultimately in our, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you referenced, the nation of Israel was to be a set apart kingdom of priests to reach the nations. They didn't do so well. The law became a a dividing separation that caused dissension because the way they approached it. But in the future, it won't be that. The Jewish people will recognize their role to be kingdoms. And then Peter says, right now, we as the church have that responsibility to declaring God's word to the nation. And he's not saying we took away and repeated place their role so they'll no longer have a role. But in this meantime, we now have that responsibility. God has never left without a witness in this world, and he's, he's given that to the church, mm-hmm. and we need to be, be doing that witness. The Jews, as you say, didn't mm-hmm. do very well. Mm-hmm. They did turn inwardly, and they began to misinterpret Scripture and the purpose of it. But we as the church need to be looking outward, sharing the gospel. As Professor Pickman, one of our colleagues, would say our hope is bound in the Jewish people, the coming kingdom, isn't it? It's bound in them accepting the Messiah. And that's why Paul says to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. It's that until the Jewish people respond, there will not be uh, God's plan for the future that's coming in. They Mm -hmm. will respond one day, but Paul says you make sure you go to the Jew first. Mm -hmm. If they reject Paul, if they reject you and I, then of course we don't stop there, move on. But Paul always gives the Jewish people as he travels in his missionary journey the opportunity to respond. 
Well, the book of Acts records the 40-day post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, the Messiah. It is interesting that Jesus is still preaching about the kingdom. Why is that important? Well, you know, this is a good question, and I don't, I'm not, I don't have a satisfying answer as I would like to, but I, th- mm-hmm. I think that Christ is speaking about that because he wants his disciples to understand that he has not given up on the Jewish people. And I'm sure that part of that teaching was to explain to them why it hasn't come in mm-hmm. now that he's died and resurrected and why he seems to be turning away from them and going to develop this church and why he's promising that the Spirit will not come upon the nation but upon them. So I'm sure that Christ is having a chance to explain to them as aspects of the kingdom that they would not have known. But then, you know, when he gets up on the Mount of Olives and is about to ascend, they say, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, they, they seem to think that, okay, it's yeah. been delayed, but they're hoping not too long. Right. And Christ doesn't say, of course, that the kingdom is going to come now. He says that that's in the Father's time. What I want you to do as believers in me, followers of me, is to be witnesses. And not to just be witnesses to the Gentiles or not just to the Jewish people. You're to be witnesses at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and throughout the whole world. And so I think he's wanting them to understand that the kingdom in its fulfillment has been delayed but it absolutely will come. And that would have been perfect time for him to correct the theology of his disciples if the kingdom was already established, don't you absolutely. think? Absolutely. At this time, you're going to restore the kingdom. He would have said, yes, you know, as soon as the spirit comes, then you'll have the kingdom. But he doesn't use And when you go through the epistles, you know, they're not speaking about us as a kingdom. I know there's a lot of people who like to speak about Christians as kingdom kids and, and the church is the kingdom and everything. But, but the church is the body of Christ and the church is a building and a church is a bride. And it seems to me that we want to use biblical terms for who the church is, because if you use a term that is assigned to the Jewish people or a future kingdom in which Christ is ruling over, you can begin to get messed up and you can begin to get to claim some of the promises. Many of our health and wealth preachers believe that we're in the kingdom. They talk a lot about that. Therefore, you can claim all the promises of the kingdom. And it puts God in a bad light because the reality is when they claim all these promises of total healing and resurrection from the dead, and it just does not happen. And I'm saying because they have misapplied that term kingdom, of course, God is ruling in our hearts and Christ right. is within the church. There's a type of rule there, but not the rule that is defined by the Old Testament. Well, now let's talk about Revelation 20. I trust that our listeners up to this point have now been persuaded, as we said earlier, that the teachings of the millennium are found throughout the Old and New Testament. It's not just found in Revelation chapter 20, which some scholars want to say limited only to that chapter, but we can learn a lot about the millennium from Revelation 20. Would you share what this passage teaches about? You know, in order to start in chapter 20, we always have to back up a a little bit. And the context is in Revelation chapter 19, Christ has returned to the earth and the word of God is in his mouth is like sharp sword. And he has the title on him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So that certainly is an indication he's coming to rule and he's going to take care of the nations of the world who come against him. And so Daniel 2 and 7 are going to be fulfilled. The nations will not win. He's going to set up his kingdom. And so in Revelation chapter 20, in order for Christ to set up his kingdom, he does remove Satan. He binds him. The beast and the false prophet at the end of chapter 19 have been thrown into the lake of fire. I call them the unholy trinity. You know, the the Satan is trying to masquerade as God and the Antichrist is trying to masquerade as Christ and and the beast is trying to imitate the Holy Spirit. And so two of them are cast into the lake of fire. Satan is bound for a thousand years kind of wish God would just have taken care of him, but he's got a plan. And so in chapter 20, what we have is in those first three verses is the binding of Satan so he could have no influence over the world for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Now, So that's uh, a literal binding. That's not just limiting his influence the world. It, it doesn't appear to be. It, 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 God binds him and restricts him, and then he will allow him to be released at the end of a thousand years, and then we'll see what Satan does, mm-hmm. and he's free to go about his normal way of being the deceiver father of lies. And so chapter 20, verse 1 to 3 is, is about Satan is binding. And then in verse 4 and following, it describes this thousand year period. It's already used thousand year once. It will use it six more times in this. And it is going to talk about uh, what will happen this thousand years. Although it does not spend a lot of time talking mm-hmm. about it. You have to assume and understand from the Old sure. Testament what's going to happen. But it does indicate that there will be a judgment on people coming into that thousand year period who are not believers. So I believe 
believe that these are the unrighteous people coming out of the tribulation period. They're not going to get a chance to experience the kingdom of God on. But those who are righteous are going to come into this kingdom. I believe that we as church, the bride of Christ, will rule and reign during that time, as you have said, because we'll be coming back with him, not to fight. He's the one who's fighting, but we'll come back as his bride. And then there seems to be indications that the Old Testament saints will have an opportunity to experience this kingdom on earth. And so, although here in chapter 20, it doesn't say specifically Old Testament saints, it does talk about a resurrection, including the resurrection of those martyrs during the period of the tribulation. And so I believe that all those who have exercised faith, like Abraham, who believe God for his promises, ultimately the promise is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, that they will come into this kingdom and they will experience this wonderful time on earth that they'd always dreamed about, mm. that they'd always prayed for, they'd always hoped for. And so as we think about the return of the Lord, the second advent, it's the reverse of the rapture, right? The wicked are taken to judgment and the righteous remain, whereas the rapture, before the tribulation, the righteous are taken and the wicked remain. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so now there's this judgment and there's going to be a final judgment at the end of a thousand years called the great white throne and so it does not appear that the unrighteous are resurrected at all at the beginning of that thousand year period but there will be a time when the unrighteous from all the ages will appear before the great white throne and there will be judgment there and they'll be cast into the lake of fire never intended for humans for satan and his angels but uh, they will experience that because they've not responded to the message mm. that has been preached. So the church will have been raptured and we receive our glorified bodies, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and, and on at that same time, right? At the rapture, we return with glorified bodies, rule with Christ, but those who get saved during the tribulation have their physical bodies so that they continue to populate the earth. Populate and the earth. Someone rain. that dies yeah. 100 years is a they, young life. I don't quite know what it means, us ruling and reigning with Christ. I mean, we will have positions of authority, it seems to indicate in the Gospels that, that some of those positions may depend upon the faithfulness, to be a faithful servant to the Lord, to carry out our responsibility. But how all that will work yeah. is not given in detail. It's kind of like when it happens, we'll be saying, oh, obviously, this, this yeah. is what would happen. So Jesus does say that the disciples will rule on thrones, 12, 12 thrones. thrones. And, yeah, yeah. And this parable of stewards... What we do with this life is important, right? Yes, yes. And in, in these rewards that we have, perhaps some of them will be just laying them down like those crowns at the feet of Jesus. Perhaps Christ will recognize some of those uh, that we will have positions of responsibility. I might rule over Columbus, my hometown. You might get Dallas. <laughs> Dallas is a lot, lot larger. And... I'm not sure I want Dallas. No. <laughs> and many times I think we want to know everything that is to come. I think God gives us enough to let us know it's coming and the nature of what it will be, but not the details. And sometimes we get so caught up in the details that we forget what the whole purpose of this time will be. Which is a great reminder that scripture is progressively revealed. So we need to understand the prophets as we understand yeah, Revelation Yeah, we're, we're not moving from that which is false to that which is true, that which is incomplete to that which is more complete. And so I had a person come to me one time and said, I'm, I'm just going to go away and I'm going to study the book of Revelation and I'm going to find out what God's saying. So I said, you are going to start at the beginning, aren't you? And they said, yeah, <laughs> chapter one. I said, no, no, <laughs> you've got to go back into the Old Testament. That's yeah. the context. The revelation, the revealing of God has already occurred and then it comes to its finality in the book of Revelation seems to me Genesis 1, 27, 28 starts right there where God says his purpose for human history is to rule and reign in his place. That's right. right. And it's finally fulfilled in Revelation 20. Absolutely. And so it actually comes full circle, doesn't it? Because when you start looking at the new heavens and the new earth and that there is this garden and there is righteousness there and there's a tree of life there. So finally God gets it back to where he started. And I think if God doesn't get it back to where he started, in a sense, he failed. And I think Satan would have a measure of victory. But Satan is defeated. At the very end of that thousand years, the people who've been born during that time will have to make a decision. Are they going to follow this Christ who's been ruling? You would just think they would say absolutely yes. But because of the sinful nature of man, despite all that evidence mm. of God's goodness to them, Satan will deceive some of them and they will experience judgment. Mm. Of course, we're persuaded that this is the, the best reflection of a consistent understanding of the story of 
scripture from Genesis to Revelation, consistently applying this historical, grammatical, literal approach. Yes, it works, yeah. you know, and not just that it works. God has said it, and so it's true whether we would see how it's going to work. I always say, you know, obedience is required. Understanding is optional. And, and there are some things that we don't understand, but we are going to believe God's word that this is going to come true. Well, Dr. Bramer, as we bring this podcast to a close, for our listeners, why is the millennium an important thing to understand and to teach in our churches, Sunday school classes, small groups? I think that there's two reasons why it's important. Number one is it allows us to have a literal, grammatical, historical understanding of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. It it just allows us to continue to interpret the Bible in the way that the authors indicated they want it to be interpreted. And because of that, we can see that all of God's promises will absolutely come true. Mm -hmm. God is is true. He is faithful. He's not a liar. He doesn't change his thinking, well, I I used to mean this, but now I mean this. What he meant is what he said and what we need to believe. And so the millennial kingdom will allow so many of the promises given to the nation of Israel, to Mm -hmm. the descendants of Abraham, about the Davidic king and about the tribes coming back to the land and Ezekiel, the the dry bones rising and them experiencing Mm -hmm. this wonderful presence of God in the land. So The millennial is important because it allows God's word to be fulfilled Mm. and God's word to be fulfilled in a literal manner. And so it fits so nicely from beginning to end. And uh, you can take your Bible and read it. As a common person, you don't need a PhD to understand this meta narrative. No, no. All you need is to continue to read your Bible so that you get all of the factors. And so God gave teachers to the church, and it's not because we've got some sort of supernatural insight. God has just allowed us to have time to study and examine mm-hmm. these things so that we can put them together for a person who hasn't had all that time. But we should never come with some sort of insight that a person could not get for themselves, you know. Dr. Kaiser used to always say, put your finger in the verse. You know, and when, when we say <laughs> something, great. it's biblical. And that's what, so when people read the Bible, they're just kind of surprised that, oh, I can understand that. That's yeah. what the pastor said. And, and it's because there is this plainness of scripture that someone with the Holy Spirit within them, with a tremendous desire to understand the word, can read it and understand. And we tie that really phrase we often use is authorial intent, right? That's the source of meaning. What did God intend to communicate? And he's successful in doing so. Yes. And because it's inspired of God, there are no errors in there. And so we need to understand that God who created communication, Mm -hmm. who created words and grammar, that's the way he communicated. And so as I communicate with you, you communicate with me, there is this proper understanding of how we communicate We can apply that to the scriptures, and we don't need to come up with some sort of allegorical or spiritualizing way of understanding scripture. Well, that is it for today's podcast. Dr. Bramer, thank you for joining me for the recording of this podcast. And to our listeners, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a positive review on whatever podcast platform that you use to listen to your podcasts. This will help our program become more accessible to those who are searching for faith-affirming programming And if you'd like to sit under the teaching of Dr. Bramer and many other excellent professors, you can study here in Dallas at Dallas Theological Seminary. You can also study at one of our teaching sites around the U.S., or you can study online. To learn more, visit dts.edu. That's dts.edu. Well, I hope that you, our listeners, will join us again next week for another great podcast. But until next time, never forget, Bible and theology matters, because what you believe determines how you behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.